Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this, this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco. Petruccione. I'm the interim director of, of NITEX. And this afternoon, we have the great pleasure to have Professor Emil uh, Roduna with us and Chad Kruger, who is a co-author of, uh, of this work. And I've asked uh, Chad, who is a NITEX associate, uh, to please uh, br briefly introduce uh, our speaker. So Chad, if you would like to, to do so, the floor is all yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Francesco, and good afternoon, everyone. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Prof. Emil Rodener is a former chair of physical chemistry at the University of Stuttgart. And since his retirement until last year, he was a part-time extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria. He has published two advanced textbooks. The first is a monograph on nanoscopic materials, size-dependent phenomena, while for the second book, he included three co-authors and focused on optical spectroscopy, fundamentals and advanced applications. He has a very broad research interest, which includes studies on structure, size effects and magnetism of platinum nanoclusters and dynamics of molecules in the pores of zeolites, mechanisms of elementary steps in catalysis, and proton conductivity of fuel cell polymer membranes. At the University of Pretoria, he helped building up activities on the electrochemical conversion of CO2 to liquid fuels using solar energy, which is of particular interest to South Africa, as we all know so well. His current retirement status allows him to work on fundamental questions, such as the topic he will talk about today. Um, to make it a bit more personal, my path crossed with Prof. Rodeners about eight years ago. And at the beginning, we didn't interact much, but we took note of each other's work on artificial photosynthesis, especially. Our first serious collaboration started in around 2017, when we worked together on a book on optical spectroscopy, which was then published in 2018. And then in the same year, in 2018, Prof. Rodiner approached me and told me that there's a fundamental physics problem he was trying to wrap his hand or, uh, head around. And that's a question, why are microscopic systems time reversible while macroscopic ones are not? There must be a smooth transition between the microscopic and macroscopic worlds. And what followed was an interesting journey of about four years until our work was finally published in physics reports. Well, I must say it was mostly the fruit of Emil's thinking about this topic. My involvement was mainly with the quantum aspects, but this is the topic he will introduce to us today. So thank you, Francesco, for accepting Emil to share some of these findings to the NITEX audience. And Emil, the floor is yours. Absolute pleasure. And maybe while Emil, just before Emil starts, a quick reminder to the participants to please make use of the Q&A to ask questions. And um, Chad will help me moderate the question. And at the end of the talk, you can raise your hand physically <laughs> or no, virtually, and, and, and we will give you the right to, 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 to talk. Yeah, so please, Professor Rubner. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Petruccione, for your kind invitation to this webinar. And thank you, Chad, for your introduction. I'd like to add that I appreciate our collaboration a lot and I benefit a lot from the exchange with you. And actually at the moment we are working on another <laughs> seems to be maybe four years project uh, which has to do with the interpretation and consequences of a rigid interpretation of the Schrodinger equation. And it uh, seems that uh, when you do this interpretation, there are quite a number of things which are quite different from what is told today in the textbooks about the foundations of quantum mechanics and even in the scientific literature. But that is not the subject today. Today, we have a double title, the origin of irreversibility in thermodynamic processes or is memory a new parameter of the physical state of matter? Maybe you wonder now how these two titles can be titles of the same talk, but I hope that 
by the end of the lecture, you will have understood. Well, you know, memory is associated with a brain and therefore I have a brain here and the memory is somehow dissipating a bit. And I also have these, uh, these, uh, yeah, this gear, the cogwheel gears. And if you reverse the direction of rotation of one of the cogwheels, it will reverse all of the connected cogwheels. So that's something about time reversibility. That's why I have this figure here. So statement of the problem, what means time reversibility? Well, if we have an analytical function f of t, and then we change t to minus t at all places in this function, then this reverses a process. So this is a time reversible function. And Newtonian dynamics, electromagnetic dynamics, the Schrodinger equation, of course, also the time dependent Schrodinger equation, they are all time reversible. Or another word of time reversibility is they are deterministic, but thermodynamics is not. Thermodynamics is a further fundamental law of science. So the question is, why are several of these laws time reversible, but thermodynamics is not? And in fact, all these theories should be able to describe the same piece of matter or the same processes. So we have a small problem here. And in fact, it's quite an old problem. The question was formulated the following way. How can microscopic equations of motion that are symmetric to time reversibility give rise to macroscopic behavior that clearly does not share this symmetry? So this uh, is an old conundrum that goes back more than 150 years to Maxwell and then was followed up by Thomson or later on called uh, Baron Kelvin of Larks and the Boltzmann and other people. Microscopic systems are time reversible. Macroscopic ones are not. That was mostly the suggestion to solve this conundrum. More recently, there is a slight variation of it, which uses the fluctuation theorem. Small systems show large fluctuations, large ones show, show small fluctuations away from equilibrium. Here you have the reference of the article that Chart mentioned. It appeared in the first issue of physics reports of this year. So after an introduction, I will talk briefly about molecular dynamics simulations, then about some non-equilibrium thermodynamics, then about dissipation and its reversal, then distinguishing dissipation and loss of memory in magnetic resonance experiments. Turns out that magnetic resonance experiments are the best example to distinguish the two effects that we need to distinguish to solve this problem. So the introduction. You all know the pendulum. The pendulum swings back and forth forever if there is no friction. This is a reversible Newtonian system. So if you reverse time, then the pendulum just changes its direction, but it continues to swing the same way it did. And potential and kinetic energy are interconverted reversibly. In thermodynamics, uh, thermodynamics is determined by Boltzmann's statistics. Are you hear an important word, statistics, rather than dynamics. 
Potential energy is converted irreversible into kinetic energy and dissipated as heat. This is also called the arrow of time. So on the left hand side, we have this little child on a sledge and it will go back and forth forever like the pendulum. On the right hand side, another picture from winter time. It's not quite winter at my place, but it's coming soon. If you have an avalanche, you also have a conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy when the snow slides down. But then the avalanche comes to rest. It has lost its potential energy, but where is the kinetic energy? Well, the kinetic energy has been dissipated to heat. So this is the arrow of time. So what is the reason for this different behavior of the two things? The avalanche will not go back up, although the energy is still there. It's there in the form of heat, but it will never go back up. So just brief, a brief introduction to the laws of thermodynamics. You certainly know the laws of thermodynamics are all empirical, not derived from first principles. They apply to large numbers of particles, typically of the order of the Loschmidt number. And this is also called the thermodynamic limit. So about 10 to the 23 particles can also do with much less, it still works. The first law of thermodynamics is just conservation of energy, which is supposed to hold always. The second law of thermodynamics is the arrow of time. It applies, it says that spontaneous processes in an isolated system are always accompanied by an increase of the total entropy. And by total entropy, I mean entropy of a system of interest, and its environment. And together, we often call it the universe. So the change of entropy of the universe is equals to the change of entropy of a system and the change of entropy of the environment. And that can be larger or equal to zero. If it is larger than zero, then we call the process a spontaneous process and it is irreversible thermodynamically irreversible. If it is equals to zero, then it is thermodynamically a reversible process. We also call this equilibrium. So we have to distinguish two types of use of reversibility. One is time reversibility and the other one is thermodynamic irreversibility. And this is easy to mix up. It's actually the reason why the correct answer hasn't be, been found soon enough. Equivalent to this formulation of entropy by entropy for the second law of thermodynamics, but a bit more practical, is the delta G of a system that is less equal zero and it holds just for isothermal, isobaric processes, in which case we can neglect the environment of the system because it's not really practical to always calculate the entire universe. So we chemists, we prefer to use the delta G, the free energy as a criterion for spontaneity and not the entropy. And the entropy, you know, is a measure of disorder. It increases with temperature and it decreases with increasing concentration. The second law of thermodynamics, the arrow of time is a criterion for the direction of spontaneous processes. You know that heat can never flow spontaneously from a colder to a warmer body. If you have a cup of coffee, then heat will dissipate, but the heat is still in the room. And when the coffee is cold, the heat will never come back and heat your coffee back up. Spontaneous processes are always accompanied by dissipation of heat, 
or by a decrease of concentration. So if we replace the entropy term by a delta of heat, by a change, an infinitesimal change of heat, and I'm using a different delta here for the Q, for the heat Q, because it's not a, a state property. Heat is not a state property, but dQ divided by the temperature of the system, that is the change of entropy of the system, and dQ dissipated to the environment, divided by the temperature of the environment, that's the change of entropy in the environment. So this is what you get for a temperature gradient, and you can write a similar equation for a concentration gradient. So in a Newtonian system, which is time reversible, and here also thermodynamically reversible, then dQ is zero. There is no heat dissipation, but dQ non equal zero is essential for irreversible processes. And we have lots of irreversible processes in our daily life. Everything that changes in time is an irreversible process, like photosynthesis, self organization, the origin of life. It's always important. Heat death. That's the ultimate fate of the universe. We say it will have a maximum of entropy. So there is a number of processes which seem to be in contradiction to the second law. For example, if you have a cold night, then water freezes in the pond to ice. Now ice is a solid, it has higher order, so it has a lower entropy but it seems that this happens spontaneously. If you have a mixture of salt or sugar in solution and you let the solution evaporate, then the concentration changes and your salt or sugar crystallizes, which looks to happen spontaneously because you don't do anything to it. Or mixtures can be separated by distillation. Living organisms, form and reproduce sort of spontaneously. Should we really expect to find beautiful butterflies coming out in a world that degrades towards heat death? In fact, this only is a seeming contradiction to the second law. It's not in real contradiction. And the secret is that it's the second law is valid, but the second law applies to the whole universe, which consists of the system of interest to us, which is a closed system. The closed system does not exchange matter with the environment, but it exchanges heat or work with the environment. And by doing so, it changes the entropy of the system and the entropy of the environment. And in a part of the universe, in the system, the entropy is allowed to decrease as long as the entropy of the universe still increases in a spontaneous process. Or work needs to be done on the system or heat dissipated by the system to get a decrease of the system's entropy. We need a gradient, a heat gradient, or in general, a non-equilibrium situa situation for, for spontaneous processes to occur. All spontaneous thermodynamic processes lead to some losses in entropy. Nothing will go without any gradients. Now, for the description of matter and of processes, we have our different uh, methods. Like we have Newtonian mechanics, classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we describe a few body system 
by the, uh, the coordinates and by the velocities. Or if you have a many body ensemble, then you have environment, uh, you have energies, expectation values of energies and expectation values of entropies, for example. Both systems are time reversible, but the classical mechanics does not equilibrate. Molecular dynamics will equilibrate eventually. Quantum mechanics, time independent quantum mechanics. There you have an expectation value of energy, you have some expectation value of a density distribution for electrons, for example. And because this is assumed time independent, it's also not time reversible. If it doesn't contain time, it cannot depend on time. And so it does also not equilibrate. But we have the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So then the coordinates and the velocities and the energies are time dependent. This is still time reversible, but it does not, or maybe not always equilibrate. Then we have thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we don't describe uh, coordinates and velocities of individual particles. We have some bulk properties like pressure, volume, temperature, entropy, energy, or expectation values of these if you use statistical thermodynamics, which is not for the bulk, for, but for an ensemble of particles. They both equilibrate. Thermodynamics normally does not involve time, but you can also do it, you can also do a time dependence of it. I will show that briefly a bit later. Classical and often quantum mechanics does not involve temperature. Understanding the difference between time reversibility and thermodynamic reversibility could lead to a unified description of matter, which many people would like to, to do, you know. So molecular dynamic simulations, MD simulations. The conventional form of molecular dynamics follows Newtonian dynamics and it is time reversible, like a billiard game. And therefore it is deterministic. On today's computers, such calculations can be conducted with a very large number of particles and they lead to equilibrium velocity distribution. Now on a computer, it is possible to stop the whole simulation instantly, meaning at the same instant of time for all particles, and then reverse the motion of all particles instantaneously and restart the simulation. That reverts the situation back to the initial state, away from equilibrium. Like here, you might start out with a high potential energy, and then you do a simulation, and the simulation comes to equilibrium after some time. So molecular dynamics simulations, conventional form are reversible in time. These can be reversed. We can get back to the initial state if we reverse all the trajectory. Total energy is converged conserved, but entropy is not. Entropy is a maximum at the initial high energy state with a low probability. Here we have an example. On the left, we have a box with some ideal gas particles and these vectors here, these arrows represent the velocity vectors. So these particles move, we have initially a random velocity distribution. So we have collisions with the walls. They should all be elastic. And we have collisions between particles. After enough collisions, 
the random velocity distribution changes to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This is an equilibrium distribution. But the collisions in the Newtonian case, they are elastic collisions, so they are time reversible. But we can have a second process, and this is shown by these red arrows. This is the, the black body radiation, Planck's black body radiation. So a particle can emit a photon and cause some uh, recoil effect. And the photon stays within the box and can be reabsorbed by the particles and exchange. So this process also leads to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution because there is only one equilibrium distribution of such a system, which is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And we can reach this distribution either by elastic collisions or by black body radiation, which is not reversible. They lead to the same equilibrium. So we have an equilibrium and the process that leads to this equilibrium can be reversible or it can be irreversible. Now because we can have really very many particles in this molecular dynamic simulation in modern computers, we conclude that the size is not really the origin of thermodynamic irreversibility. Actually, if evolution of the universe were time reversible, the dinosaurs might come back. And I'm sure most of you will believe that they will not come back. So somehow Newtonian description of matter misses something. We can introduce corrections to the Newtonian molecular dynamic simulations. So these cor corrections can, for example, describe friction, which is a bit a complicated process, or it can describe probabilistic events, for example, the decay of excited states, like a radioactive decay. In such a decay, the exact decay time is not predictable. Only the average lifetime is known. This breaks time reversibility. Because if your atom would have decayed uh, late compared to its average lifetime, then this doesn't mean that the reverse process would have to happen early. Right. So excited state decay and also friction, they both lead to heat dissipation. The energy in this decay is dissipated as heat as required by the second law. Now let's do two thought experiments on collisional loss of memory. We start with a box on the upper left here. So we have a division, we have a wall in the middle. On each side, we have n particles, the same number, we have the same volume, but we have different temperature. And therefore, we have different internal energy because of the different temperature. Then we pull the wall out. So the dynamics will cause these particles to mix and the collisions will cause the uh, will cause the ensemble to get equilibrated. So we have two n particles in the end in the double volume, and the final temperature is just, just the average of the T1 and the T2 that we had initially. This is one experiment. So here we have the uh, Newtonian collisions. So this is a reversible process to equilibrium. But 
we can do a second process. And in the second process, we don't pull out the wall. We start with the same initial uh, situation. Then we don't pull out the wall, but we replace it by a wall that can transmit energy, like a metal foil. When particles on the hot side collide with, the, with this membrane, with the metal wall, then they leave the energy. And on the other side, the atoms can pick up the energy from the foil. Now here, we lose the correlation between the two atoms because the motions, the collisions with the foil are no longer uh, correlated. But we still come to an equilibrium. So again, we have two different processes, a reversible one and an irreversible one, and they lead to the same final situation. Now, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Thermodynamic equilibria are dynamic with microscopic reversibility. It's not a static case. Equilibrium looks static, but if you look at the microscopic scale, then there's always something going on. There are spontaneous statistical fluctuations about equilibrium. And these fluctuations are small for large systems. Most, most systems found in nature are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. Because if they all were in thermodynamic equilibrium, then this would be a situation where everything is dead. Nothing would happen. And we are not interested in such a situation, right? So in, for systems close to equilibrium, we have a linearity. Here we now have a time dependence in thermodynamics. So if we have the change of entropy of the universe, the time dependence, so this is the entropy, uh, the entropy change in time. And this consists of two parts. Pi is the entropy production rate in the system. And phi is the entropy flux rate from the system to the environment. And this has to be larger or equals to zero. The flux is a linear function of the offset from equilibrium. Now, this is what Rayleigh predicted early on and then Onsager continued on it and many others worked on it. So this is for systems close to equilibrium. But we can have nonlinear systems far from equilibrium. They are much more complex. They may be turbulent or even chaotic and form what we call dissipative structures, self-organized, dynamic, ordered structures. Tornadoes or oscillating chemical reactions are examples for nonlinear systems far from equilibrium. This is a topic of great interest in today's research. Photosynthesis or fueling processes always keep systems in a steady state away from equilibrium. Because if we would allow the system to come to equilibrium, then everything would come to rest. Dissipation. I already said heat flows spontaneously only from hot to cold. You cannot reverse the heat to come back into your coffee. Mechanical energy can be converted quantitatively into heat, but the reverse is not true. This is not symmetric. There is some loss of heat. We cannot convert all the heat back to mechanical energy. Or if you look at the Karma cycle, I'm sure you all, you're all familiar with the Karma cycle. A combustion engine works only when it dissipates heat, waste heat at the lower temperature. And this is true even 
if each of the legs of this cycle is conducted thermodynamically reversible, which means that for the system and the environment, the pressure is the same and the temperature is the same. That is thermodynamic reversibility. But we always have waste heat. If my son kicks his ball into my neighbor's window, I'm sure the neighbor will come quickly and complain about it. And if I say, well, why are you complaining? The glass is all still there. And he will say, yeah, maybe, but in an inferior form. Heat is in a similar sense, inferior to higher forms of energy. It consists of smaller quanta of energy than many other forms. So there is some irreversibility built in here. Dissipation means irreversible conversion of a form of energy into heat and transfer into a heat path. A photon absorption and emission, they are probabilistic processes. This, the theory goes back to Einstein, of course. And you know the Einstein coefficients A and B, you know the processes. If you have a two level system with energy E1 and E2, and then a photon comes where the frequency times the Planck's constant equals to the energy difference, then this radiation field that you have can stimulate the system to get excited. It can pick up a photon and bring the energy from the lower level to the upper level. The same radiation field can also cause the reverse process. This is called stimulated emission. It goes with the same Einstein coefficient B. So this is symmetric, but there is an additional process. There is also a spontaneous emission with an emission coefficient A. So this breaks now the symmetry because we don't have the corresponding absorption process. There's no spontaneous absorption. Stimulated absorption and emission are both proportional to a radiation field, but spontaneous emission goes also without a radiation field. Spontaneous emission is strongly favored at high frequencies. Elastic collisions are time reversible, but absorption emission is probabilistic and therefore not time reversible because the exact time when photons are emitted or when they are absorbed is not predictable. That is what kills the time, time reversibility. Probabilistic processes are never time reversible. If you have an excited state, like here, then it has a finite lifetime. Actually, this finite lifetime is characteristic for quantum state because if we had a, a continuum energy level, like in a metal, then the lifetime of the excitation would be effectively zero. So the finite lifetime is an effect of quantum nature of matter. The energy is dissipated in one large quantum or in many small quanta. The decay is of probabilistic nature and the finite lifetime is the origin of the loss of memory and the loss of time reversibility. So why is heat in an inferior form of energy? Let's look at the reverse 
of the emission. If you have a one photon emission, then the reverse is a one photon absorption. The intensity of this absorption is proportional to a radiation field with a density, energy density rho. So it's proportional to Einstein coefficient p. <coughs> now, in principle, we can have a two photon absorption at the same time, two identical photons via this absorption goes via a virtual level and this process is possible but the intensity goes with the energy density squared so it's a second order process it's much less probable than the single photon absorption in principle we can have many photon absorptions via many virtual energy levels. This will require a very high uh, energy density to occur. But we can, instead of having a virtual level, we can also have a real level. So that means we can absorb one photon to this excited intermediate state, which then has a certain lifetime, and then comes a second, during this lifetime comes a second photon and it is also absorbed. This is possible. Now Maria Göppert Meyer has worked on the simultaneous, on the absorption of simultaneous identical photons in her PhD thesis. And she calculated the probability of these. So, the, the dispersion of photons, the emission of photons via many small quanta is highly probable, much more probable than the absorption of the same energy in small uh, quanta. Here is an example of it. We take a red dye a red dye molecule, rhodamine B. This is an excellent one photon and also a two photon absorber. In bright sunlight, a molecule absorbs roughly one photon about once a second. But the absorption of two photons simultaneously, it takes about 10 million years and no three photon absorption is expected through the entire, over the entire age of the universe. This is the broken symmetry of absorption and emission. Now the fluctuation theorem. I already said thermodynamic equilibria are dynamic, which means that all the properties fluctuate. Like there is, you know, there's Brownian motion, but not only the position fluctuates, also the entropy fluctuates, the local temperature fluctuates, the local energy fluctuates, everything fluctuates. The entropy fluctuates by an amount, let's say, of delta S. Now, is this a violation of the second law of thermodynamics because the delta S can be negative. And for the spontaneous process, the entropy should always increase, we learned. So is this in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics? No, it's not because the second law of thermodynamics is defined for an ensemble. And for the ensemble, the expectation value is larger or equals to zero. But the fluctuation theorem says that the probability for a change of entropy being negative, spontaneously negative, divided by the probability of this entropy change, the same 
change of entropy being positive decays with e to the minus delta s. So for large systems, the fluctuations away from equilibrium are small due to partial averaging because some of the subsystems will have small, small fluctuations, some of them will have negative, some of them will have positive fluctuations. Then in the average, the fluctuation of the ensemble will be quite small. So this looks to be a phenomenon, a phenomenon that is in agreement or consistent with the size dependence of time reversibility. But you know it's not. Because importantly, these fluctuations are probabilistic and not deterministic. We are not able to predict at which point of time exactly the entropy decreases or increases by reversing time. So we should not expect to find time reversibility by reversing time in a probabilistic process. Therefore, the fluctuation theorem is not the solution for our question. Distinguishing dissipation and loss of memory in a magnetic resonance experiment. I said, this is the best example. Well, let's go to this race track. You know that the whole group of people starts running at the shot of the gun, but some of the runners are faster than others, so they get ahead. So there is some defacing. But after some time, after a certain time lag, there is an inversion pulse, a 180 degrees inversion pulse. This can be done in magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, resonance type experiment for spin systems. This is a time reversal. So the athletes change their direction. So the fastest ones after the change will be behind, but they will catch up. And after another time period tour, in principle, they should all have caught up with the slower ones. So there will be an echo. Well, in principle, this echo can be the same size as the original uh, situation. But in reality, it is often not because you know, some of the runners are getting tired a bit earlier than others. So it's not quite reversible. There is a decay time of the size of the echo between the different pulses. And this decay time is called T2 relaxation or phase memory time, or also decoherence time. So phase memory time, this is the correct, the correct nomenclature for the process because it has to do with memory. Because the precession of the spins in the XY plane is at constant energy. So there is no energy dissipation accompanying this phase decoherence time. So here on the lowest picture, we have again the discoherence of the spins if they rotate in the XY plane. And on the upper picture, we have the other process where we have an in a non-equal population of the two energy states. Let's say we have a higher population of the upper state, and then we have a dissipation of energy. This is a T1 process, a T1 relaxation or longitudinal relaxation. This is a relaxation 
into thermodynamic equilibrium population with energy dissipation. Whereas the T2 relaxation, the phase memory relux relaxation or decoherence involves no heat dissipation and is entropy neutral. It represents loss of memory and therefore loss of time reversibility. These are two different processes. The spins know quite well. <coughs> also, both processes go into some time, some type of equilibrium. So the conclusion, the process to reach thermodynamic equilibrium, the arrow of time is called equilibration. Yeah, you know that. It is related to dissipation of energy or more generally of entropy. The loss of memory equivalent to decoherence or dephasing is often called thermalization in literature. And this is not related to energy. It is related to timing. Thermalization seems to mean that it is related to energy, but it is not. It is related to timing. So we have the, the confusion and the reason for this confusion in part is an unlucky terminology. The arrow of time is not really related to time. It's only related to the direction of the spontaneous process. And thermalization is not related to energy transfer. So we can summarize with this picture. If we start out in the upper left corner here with our system, at the coherent or random motion of equilibrium, then we can have dissipation of energy. The arrow of time is what it was called, or I call it here arrow of dissipation. It leads to an increase of free energy. And then we reach a system at coherent, still coherent random, or coherent motion, but now at thermodynamic equilibrium, we go from off equilibrium to equilibrium. This is an equilibration process, but we can have a different process. We can have the thermalization process. Then we first have the loss of memory. We lose the phase memory. And in a second process, this is the arrow of thermalization. And in the second process, we then have the equilibration. And this equilibrium here is an equilibrium, a thermodynamic equilibrium, and also a thermalized system. So it looks as if these processes would always be nicely separable, but they are not. In fact, they often occur in parallel, but with different relaxation times. We know that from magnetic resonance experiments. If you do, if you measure a T1 relaxation time and the T2 relaxation time in the same system, you normally get quite different numbers. So there's essentially two processes. The arrow of time is only the thermodynamic equilibration, but in addition, we have this loss of memory, the thermalization process. So the phase memory time two, T2, is a measure of decoherence and thus of memory. It is of relevance in quantum computing, for example, in the ST0 interconversion of spin pairs. There's also other memory memories in materials. For example, elastic materials can have a memory for their original lengths. For example, a rubber band or a spring, if you pull it, then it will relax back to the original length. Memory is thus maybe a new parameter for the characterization of the physical state, or maybe not a new parameter, but the parameter 
has gotten a new meaning. In the case of NMR, we have a quantitative measurement of the phase memory. It's the phase memory time T2, but this is not related to chemical equilibrium. Is memory related to information entropy? Maybe, I don't really know because I have never really understood why information should have a thermodynamic unit, the unit of entropy. So, you know, the fairy tale of Hensel and Gretel, this also has to do with memory. They tried to help the memory by putting breadcrumbs on the way, but when they came back, the breadcrumbs had disappeared because the bird had come and picked them up all, the memory was lost. The time reversibility was lost. Loss of memory is responsible for time irreversibility. And this is due to, to stochastic processes or probabilistic processes. Time irreversibility is not a thermodynamic parameter. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rodner, for the very systematic approach to this very interesting subject. Um, Chad, would you like to assist me in moderating the questions? Uh, I don't see at the moment any questions in the Q&A, but um, I would like to encourage the participants maybe to raise virtually their hand and we can ask them and we can allow them to, to ask the question in person. Or, uh, Chad, would you like to comment on the, on the, on the presentation? Um, yes, I, I could do it. Um, maybe for those Please. who are interested in, in quantum mechanics, um, it's interesting that there are different classes of isolated quantum systems specifically that exhibit non-ergodic behavior um, and do not thermalize. And some examples are, um, um, for example, uh, are near in in integrable quantum systems, um, Hilbert space fragmentation, quantum scarring, many body localization. Um, if, if you know about such systems, they um, all of them equilibrate, um, but none of them thermalize. So that is the quantum mechanical, uh, a few um, examples from quantum mechanical systems where the equilibration and thermalization are also separate processes. So just two cents from my side. Um, yes, I see there's already yes. one question that has appeared. Um, thank oh, no, you, that's Yeah, thank you, Chad, for that.